Welcome everyone. My name is Erica Collins. I am the engineering mentor for the part-time remote immersive. Um, I went through Codesmith my, myself. I was part of the Petri 7 cohort. Um, I also have two family members who went through Codesmith. So it's kind of a family thing now. Um, previous to software engineering, I was an educator. So I did six years with kindergarten. And then I also spent two years with uh, second and third graders with language-based learning differences and really loved uh, teaching. And so it's really fun to kind of combine that with software engineering. So throughout tonight, I'm going to be doing, uh, going through a series of diagramming demos. And they're going to kind of be layered with complexity. So I'll start basic and we're going to get a little bit more complex as we go. I'm going to be asking for help throughout the entire time. I probably will just call on you and ask you to walk me through it. Uh, so be ready. It'll be fun. And you're going to learn a lot. Hopefully. I think you will. These are kind of like the three topics we are going to focus in on tonight. So let me get my highlighter out again. The first thing is objects. And here's what objects are. Or here's what they provide us. They provide us or allow us to encapsulate information. You can think of information as data and functionality. So for objects, we have data and functionality right there together. That's objects. Functions are a little different. Functions allow us to bundle frequently used code. Or you could also think of it as frequently used instructions for JavaScript, right? Because JavaScript is just instructions for the browser. So we bundle it together and then we can reuse that code as many times as we want. That makes our code more dry. Dry is a principle we're gonna talk about today. It stands for, stands for do not repeat yourself. We don't wanna repeat ourselves in our code too much. We wanna keep it maintainable. We wanna keep it readable and concise. Functions allow us to keep our code more dry because you can reuse this thing over and over and over again. And then finally, we have execution context. I feel like of all the concepts, this one's a little bit more vague. You're gonna see this diagrammed a lot and I think it will be, become more clear. But when we invoke a function or when JavaScript runs a function, we get what we call a local execution context with its own local memory. We'll have more on this in a moment. So if you're like, oh shit, this is like so confusing, don't worry, we'll get into it. AJ, do you have a question? Yeah, sorry, wrong button. Um, are <laughs> objects, it, objects and variables, are they interchangeable in this concept or are they completely different when we're talking coding? When we're talking variables and objects, they're gonna be different. Okay. Yep. Yep, and we'll talk about variables on like the next slide. So stay tuned. Okay. So let's first talk about what happens when JavaScript runs code. Okay. When JavaScript runs code, it goes through the code line by line. Okay. I don't know why. There we go. Line by line. It's going to kind of read it like a book in English. We're going to go from top to bottom, left to right, okay? As it goes from top to bottom and left to right, it's going to do a few things. It's going to save the data with a label. So we can have data like maybe it's a number or a word, okay? Or a list, and we save it with a label so we can reference that data later. And then the other thing we can do and then we can use and change that data by referring back to it later using its label, okay? So for instance, over here, this is what we call declaring a variable. Um, there are two different variables that we're gonna talk about today that is used in JavaScript, let and const. Those are two different types of variables. Does anybody know the difference between let and const? I'm gonna do a freebie if, I'm, if anyone just wants to raise their hand, they can. Yes, Heather. Um, const stands for constant and it is immutable. It doesn't change. And um, let is a variable label that can change. Love it. 
So you can think of const as constant, meaning we cannot reassign it to some other value later. Let, I just think of it as JavaScript is letting us, or it will let us change the value or reassign the value later on, okay? So that's a little bit on these two variables. Now, what I was talking about over here is that we have a label with a variable and then we have some value. So we're declaring a variable called sum, that's the label, and the value of sum is zero. So later in JavaScript, if I say sum somewhere, we're gonna be referencing this value, but it's we're using that label to identify it and find it in memory later on, okay? So that's a little bit about how code runs. Now what we're gonna do, and what we're gonna do for the rest of the evening, is we are going to go in to these demos as if we are JavaScript. We are going to think like JavaScript thinks. We're gonna do what JavaScript would do. And by doing that, you're gonna gain an understanding of how JavaScript works when it is running its code. So I've got this same code snippet. The first thing I'm gonna talk about before I have somebody kind of walk us through what they're seeing is we have this thing called the global execution context. When JavaScript is reading our code, it reads it like a book in English, right? Top to bottom, left to right. When we start running our code in our JavaScript file, we are in the global execution context, okay? As we progress through tonight's workshop, you are going to see that eventually we can have other execution contexts, contexts that are nested within this global execution context. So it's going to be like a local execution context within the global. And you can have those nested further and further and further. Okay. For now, we're going to keep it super simple. We're just going to be in our global execution context. And whenever we have that global execution context, we also have global memory. This is where we're going to store variables and functions and things like that so we can reference them later on, okay? Can I get thumbs on just these two components? Perfect, okay. Now, let's see. I'm gonna call on, Heather, I'm gonna call on you again because I know you just got done with JSP and I'm gonna warm everyone else up, okay? So, Heather, what I would love for you to do is walk us through from the top to the bottom. And we'll go super slowly because we're going to talk about some things as we go. So I might like interrupt and pause, but start okay. at line one. Tell us what you know about line one. Okay. So we are declaring a label sum with the keyword let, and we are um, assigning it a value of zero. And that will go in the global memory. Awesome. Okay. So over in global memory, I have sum and its value is zero. Thank you. Keep going. Then we are um, also in the global memory declaring a new label, my grades, with a keyword const. And we are assigning it the value of an array with three elements that are all numbers, 50, 75, and 100. Awesome. Your technical communication is so on point right now. Keep us going. Okay. And then we are reassigning some the value of my grades at the index of zero plus my grades at the index of one plus my grades at the index of two. Awesome. Now, let me ask you some questions so everyone can hear the answer to this. Um, why are we able to reassign some? Because if we're thinking like JavaScript does, when JavaScript hits line four, it's going to see this word sum, and it's going to say, wait a minute, do I know that? And it's going to go to global memory, and it's going to see, yes, we have some, and currently the value is zero. Why are we allowed to reassign some, this new value? Because it has the, oh, you want, do, Crystal's raising her hand. You got this, Heather. I'm going to call on Crystal next. Okay, don't you no worry. problem. 
uh, because it has the uh, appropriate keyword left, which allows yeah. you to ding, ding, ding. Okay. Now, again, if we're thinking like JavaScript, JavaScript has some work to do. So we're in this global execution context and it needs to kind of do some arithmetic. It needs to do some math. It's going to, so it's already found that it knows what sum is. So if we're continuing to think like JavaScript, then it's going to see my grades and it's going to go, wait a minute, do I know what that is? So it's going to check global memory. And yes, we have my grades and it is assigned this array. Now, for those of you who don't know what this means, this is an indexing system. So I'm going to do a little caveat or a little sidebar right here before you continue. Okay, Heather? So you might think that we would say this is the first, the second, and the third. But JavaScript arrays are indexed. Okay, so what that means is it's actually, this is the zeroth index, first index, second index. So when we have my grades and then these brackets with zero, what we're really saying is go find that my grades thing, which is an array, and what is in the zeroth index? And Heather, what is in the zeroth index for my grades? 50. Awesome. So I'm going to write down here this like basically value to 50. And what about my grades at index one? 75. Awesome. And the next one? 100. Perfect. So what is JavaScript going to do now, Heather? It's going to add them and then it's going to take that value and reassign it to sum. It's going to make that the value of sum in the global memory. Yes. So over here, sum is no longer a zero. It is going to be 225. And because we're done working on this, it's done figuring this out. This is gone and keep on moving to line six, will you? Okay. And then on line six, it is going to declare a new label um, average in the global memory um, with the keyword let. And it's going to assign it the value of the current value of sum, which is 225. Perfect. And divide it by my the length of my grades. Yes. Now, if everyone remembers my story at the beginning, this is the point when the instructor asked me what the length of the array was. And for those of you who don't know what the length property is, you're probably just as confused. But here's what the length property is. It's built in. And it tells us how many items or elements are in our array. So in this case, with our array, we have one, two, three items in our array. So the length of our array is, what is it, Heather? Three. Awesome. So what is going to be the value of average in global memory? So when it's calculated, it will be seven. Yes. Amazing. That technical communication was on point. Thank you for that. Okay. So a few things I want to just reiterate, okay? We're going to continue to go through these diagrams from top to bottom just like JavaScript will. We're gonna to continue to talk about this global execution context and the global memory that goes with it. Um, we talked about the let versus const keyword. And if you're interested in learning more about variables, make sure you go to one of the variables workshops. It's an intro to JavaScript one. We also talked about how to access different indexes within an element or within an array. We talked about the length property that's built into JavaScript. So that was this. Are there any questions about how we just went through that or any kind of logistical things? Yes, AJ. Two questions. I might have missed it. Is the semicolon, does that mean it's the end of the? It does. It's okay. like kind of like the end of the statement. End of the statement. And then yeah. the period between my grades dot length. Ah, yes. So this is um, a property. Well, technically it's like a method on here, but this is a property that we can use. And to access that and to basically get the length of this, we use this dot length. Arrays have built-in methods and properties under the hood of JavaScript that we don't necessarily see. So that's one of them. 
Great question. Okay, are we ready to move on? Perfect. Now here's the deal. That was fine, but what if we wanted to use this code over again? Because JavaScript runs from top to bottom, we can't tell it like go back to the top, right? It's done running that code. So if we wanted to be able to reuse the same code over and over again, we're gonna have to leverage something called functions. Now remember, functions bundle instructions for JavaScript. And then we can call these functions as many times as we want, thus restarting those instructions over and over again. And this is awesome. It keeps our code dry or do not repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself. So let's talk a little bit about functions. Um, their instructions, the way that we declare them. Before, when we were talking about variables, I told you we had let, and we have const. And depending on what which one of those words we use, JavaScript treats it differently, okay? Know that because when we declare a function, we have to use this special word function. That's telling JavaScript it's a function, obviously, right? After the function, we give it a label or a name, just like in a variable. We wanna be able to reference this function later on. So if we want to use this function later on, we're going to use its name average grade. Okay. Now, when we're declaring our function, we also have these parentheses. We're not going to talk about this now. We're going to talk about it, I think, on the next example. So you can ignore that for now. Now, then we have these curly brackets. Everything within those curly brackets is what we call the function body. These are the instructions that we keep talking about, the instructions that we can keep reusing over and over again. Okay, the only thing we haven't talked about is how do we tell JavaScript we want to go run that function? Because this was just the syntax to declare the function, but we actually haven't talked about how to tell JavaScript go run that function. So let me show you. Down here, you can see that label the same one that we have here, right? And then we see these parentheses. Don't get them confused with these. They're not the same thing, okay? I know they look the same, but they have a completely different purpose. When you use a function name that's been declared followed by parentheses, you are telling JavaScript, go run that function, okay? Can I get thumbs on that? We're gonna diagram this out. Okay, here we go. Ooh, who are we going to do it this time? Hey, Bryce, how about you help me out on this one? Yeah, sure. All right. All right. So um, the only thing I'm going to say before we get going, a few things, mm -hmm. actually. So we still have our global execution context. We still have our global memory, but now you all see something new. We have this thing called the call stack. What the call stack is, is it's a way for JavaScript to keep track of the current execution context. Remember how I told you we can have nested execution contexts, one within the other? Well, JavaScript has to have some way of keeping track of which context it's in. The call stack is how we are going to do that. So I'm gonna say it now and I'll remind you later, Bryce, if you need it. But every time we invoke a function, two things happen. The first thing that's going to happen is we push a stack frame to the call stack. If you don't know what that is, we'll look at it this time. And the other thing that's going to happen is we open a new execution context. It's going to be called a local execution context. And that local execution context will also have its own local memory. Okay, We're going to see this over and over again. It'll be like second nature by the end. Okay, I'm ready for you, Bryce. Walk me through like JavaScript would. And I'm gonna give you a heads up that um, we're gonna see some interesting behavior when you get to line two. So get us going and we'll see what happens. Cool. So first we're gonna declare the function average grade. And we're not going to, we're just gonna set it equal to the fun or the, um, just the 
definition line by line of it, but yes. we're not going to invoke it yet. So it's just going to be like constant migrate, sum, sum equals, it. blah, blah, blah. Something you said definition. that I don't want to breeze over yet because you nailed it and I haven't talked about it before. But for everyone who doesn't understand why we're doing this, when we declare a function and we put that function in memory, its value is what we call the function definition. And the way that we write that is just like this. It's kind of like input, function, output, these little arrows. Okay. So there's that. Now, Bryce, continue on. All right. So now we're going to jump to line nine. Oh, and You knew. Okay. You're going to have to explain it because that's what I thought you were going to get tripped up on. So can you explain <laughs> to us why we're not going to go to line two yet? So for a function body to be run, you need to invoke it. And we're just defining it in line one, not invoking it. Exactly. We haven't actually told JavaScript to go run this function. We've only declared it. Okay. So JavaScript, if we're thinking like JavaScript, it sees that we're declaring it, but we're not going to go into these curly brackets. We're going to go right past it and we hit line nine. So continue on. You're doing awesome, Bryce. Cool. So line nine, we're declaring the variable under the label output. It's constant. And we're setting it equal to the function average grade. Okay. So this is where it's going to get a little tricky. When we see line nine, we, you're right. We have this variable called output and it's going to be stored in global memory. But what we're saying is the value of output is going to be whatever the result of invoking average grade is. Now answer me Actually, this, Brian or Bryce. Have we invoked average grade yet? Like, has JavaScript done its work yet? No. Uh, so we just invoked it. It's set equal to undefined right now. Now we're yeah. going to run through it through the in the global execution context. Okay. Awesome. Actually, wait. So pause. It, it might be a local one at this You're point. You're right. So let me pause and explain this to everyone. So the reason output value is going to be undefined is because if we're going in order like JavaScript. When it hits line nine and it puts output in global memory, we don't know the value yet because we haven't actually figured out the result or the value of invoking average grade. We don't know what's going to come out of that function. Therefore, in the meantime, while JavaScript figures out what that's going to result in, it needs to be set to undefined. And you're right, Bryce. Now it's going to be those two things are going to happen. We're going to open a local execution context. Let me get my stuff out. And Bryce, what comes with our local execution context? We're going to push um, local. All right, we're going to push the function average grade to the top of the call stack. Yes, we're going to push. And create a new local stack. memory. Yep, we're going to push the stack frame to the call stack. And it's because it's the average grade function, I'll just do that. And then we have the local execution context. This is where we start nesting, right? We have one inside of another. What comes with this? A local... Local thread of execution and local memory. Local memory. And I'm going to just write the name of this one so we can remember that this is average grade. Awesome. So those are the two things that happen every time we invoke a function. Continue on. Now uh, we're going to declare uh, my grid set so equal to a constant um, with the value fifty of the of fifty seventy five one hundred as an array. Awesome! I actually just gave it away, but where are we going to store this variable? Uh, yeah, in local memory. And can you tell us why? Do you know why it's going to be in local memory? Um, because. Um, once we run the function, we open the local execution context. Therefore, yeah. everything that's now in this thread of execution will be within this local execution context. Exactly. If we just look at the call stack and we see that top stack frame, that's going to tell us what memory we're using, what execution context we're going to be running in. So yes, we're in average grade. Oh, I'm trying to do an arrow. So that's like the memory that we're going to use. Okay, keep going. Thanks. And then we're going to declare the variable sum to let and set it equal to zero in local memory again. Perfect. And we're going to reassign sum to um, my grades index zero 
plus my grades one plus my grades two. And what do those uh, correspond to? Which elements? So index zero um, is 50, index one, 75, index two is 100. Awesome. Okay. So 25 will now be some. Perfect. Okay. Now we're going to declare a new variable average. Um, to let, we're going to set it equal to sum, which is 225, divided by megrage.length, which is three. Perfect. So JavaScript, 75. if we're thinking like it, it's going to be in this execution context. You're right, 225. And you said, what was the length of the array? It's three. Perfect. So average is now 75. Okay. All right, and then we're going to return the value of average, which is 75, and that pops off average grade from the call stack and takes us back to the global execution context. And now output is no longer undefined. It's now set equal to average, which is 75. Exactly. Awesome job. I'm going to um, say that again, but a little more slowly to make sure everyone follows. Thank you so much, Bryce. That was awesome. So at this point, because we haven't talked about this word return yet on line six. Return is a special word in JavaScript and it's a super, super important word too. First of all, when JavaScript sees average, it's a value in local memory. And that value in local memory is 70, 75. So when we're talking about average, we're talking about 75. Here's what the return keyword kind of does. What it's saying is go to where you invoked this function and that's where that value is going to go. So we invoked average grade right here. This is where that value is going to be returned. So it's kind of like saying, okay, replace this now with the value and it's 75. So output value is 75. Now, before we put that in global memory, those two things happen. We pop the stack frame off the call stack. So average grade is out. And then we do something called garbage collection where all this goes away. We're done with this execution context. We don't need it anymore. And like Bryce said, output is no longer undefined. We have a value. That value is 75. How do we feel about that? Are there questions? Is there confusion? This is a great time to ask questions before we move on. Okay. Now I wanna get um, a thumbs check because here's the deal. If this felt like a breeze, then we can go to the next example. But last time I did this, I had quite a few people who wanted me to move on to line 10. So can you just show me a thumb up if you want me to move to line 10 and we can do one more go around? Perfect, thank you for the honesty. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna have Crystal. Would you wanna do this next one with me, Crystal? Yeah, yeah. sure. Yay, okay. So Crystal, just as a reminder, we are now on line 10. Oh, you know what I did? I just erased something, hold on. There we go. We would still have average grade in memory, but okay, we're on line 10. Talk to me. So under global memory, we would have the value of new output with the label for constant, and it would be um, currently undefined or- Yes, and can you remind me? Can you remind me why it's going to be undefined? Um, since JavaScript goes from top to bottom, currently it doesn't have the answer to the nested function yet. So we're going to have to, it's going to have to recall the nested function in the local memory. Yeah, it's going to have to go figure out what that value is. It's going to have to go do some work, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, undefined and we've in officially invoked average grade. Do you remember the two things that happen when we invoke a function? Yes. So first off, uh, I know that we do um, open the function in the local memory and the local execution context. Yes. So the first thing we do, oh, it didn't make my square all nice. Hold on, that's gonna drive me crazy. Or rectangle. Okay, yes, so the first thing we do is we are going to make that local execution context and local 
memory. Wonderful. And now what? And then at this point, we would go ahead and under local memory list um, my grades with the variable of constants. Close. There's one more thing we have to do over here. Do you remember uh, the uh, technical terminology to talk about the call stack and what we need to do? It's not return. It's something else. Return is at the end of the function. Yep. It's push a stack frame to the call stack. Push a stack frame to the call stack. Yes. Okay. And by the way, I will probably mix up my words in this all the time. I don't know who came up with those words, but it's so confusing. So yes. And what's going to go in here is the name of the function that we're running. So average grade. Awesome. Okay, now we're ready to hit in our function, line two. So under local memory, we would list uh, my grades with the variable with the, um, the variable constant with the array index numbers of 50, 75, and 100. Perfect. And okay. then underneath that, we would list um, some with the variable of some with a function of let, and it would be equal to zero for the current moment. Perfect. And then I believe under local execution context, we would go ahead and list out the sum uh, equation, which is sum equals my grades with index position of zero plus my grades with index position of one plus my grades with index position of two. And what do those correspond to? Great uh, technical communication, by the way. Oh, thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> index position zero, it would be the number 50. Index position one would have 75. And index position number two would be 100. Awesome. So we already evaluated that 205. And where is that 225 going to go now? The 225 is now the sum. So we're going to cross out under local memory the zero and then redefine it as 225. Wonderful. Okay. And then to finish off the local execution concept, we would go ahead and put the um, average with the function of let equals thumb my divided by uh, my grades dot length. Awesome. Yes. So we're declaring a new variable. So we're declaring a variable called average, and it is going to be assigned the evaluated result of taking sum and dividing it by migrates.length. So if we're thinking like JavaScript does, and I know you guys are probably repetitive now, but we would go and make sure we have something called average and we just declared it, so we do. Then we'd go look for something called sum and do we find it, Crystal? Yes. So and what is the value? And it would be a 225 divided by three in this case, since there's three numbers in the array. Okay. And then average would be 75. Awesome. And then what's the last few things that are gonna happen here? At this point, we have to return the average. So I believe, um, sorry. The average is going to end up as the new output. So the answer will become 75 and then the local memory closes or yes. actually. Yes. What's the right term for that? Um, you can call it garbage collection. Garbage collection. Yes. Or yeah, we like close the, lex the local execution context. And then there's one more thing we have to do. Close the call stack. Um, we're, you're so close. So when we, um, this is for everybody, when we put stack frames on, we push them on. So we push stack frames, the call stack, and then when we take them off, we pop them off. So we're going to pop the stack frame off the call stack and we return to the global execution context. Okay, excellent. Thank Amazing. you. So that was awesome. Okay, way to go. Uh, who has questions, comments, anything? They want to share. Okay, so here's the deal. This is fine, but hopefully you had a thought in your mind like, this is silly. Why would we just invoke the same function twice? Did anybody think that like, this is kind of weird that we're just invoking the same one? We're not getting a different value, right? So when we say output and the new output, it's kind of weird because it's the same thing each time. 
This isn't dynamic. We have hard-coded data. This is the grades right here. Those scores don't change. So it's really not that useful unless you always have the three scores, 50, 75, and 100. So how can we make this more dynamic? Well, we're going to make it more dynamic by utilizing something called parameters and arguments. So let's look at what those are, and then we'll do this again, but layered with a little bit more complexity. I'll start by saying this. Parameters and arguments, they get mixed up a lot. A lot of people mix these up. And it's kind of hard to conceptualize it at first, but it does get easier to understand. So let me just point out a few things. Before, when we declared our function, we had our that keyword function followed by the label that we're going to refer to it as. And then I said, look, there's parentheses, but don't worry about these yet. Remember that? Now we're going to worry about it. Those were empty before, but now you can see there's something called my grades. This right here, let me get a new color. This is called a parameter. Okay. Now down here, when we invoke average grade, before, we didn't have anything passed into those parentheses. It was just an empty parentheses. Now we have something passed in. These things that we're passing in, these are called arguments. Okay? These correspond to one another. It's kind of like a variable. This is going to be the label for our variable, and this is going to be the actual value. And the cool thing is when we go to invoke this function, we can pass in unique data every single time. So I could get the average grade for Elijah's three tests and AJ's three tests and Dewey's and Anna's, right? I can make this dynamic. Anybody can pass in data. So we have parameters and we have arguments. Here's how I want you to remember the difference between the two. And then I'll, I'll continue explaining these. I think of parameters as placeholders, okay? This, my grades, it's just a label. It's just what we're gonna refer to that data that's being passed in, okay? And you'll see this in the example. I think of arguments as our actual data. So, when I invoke average grade right here and I pass in 50, 75, and 100, let me show you what that's going to be like. It's going to be like my grades is basically equal to the value of it is this 100. It's a label for giving the data that's actually being passed into our function. And then when I, while well, I'm getting a lot of colors on my screen, <laughs> and then when I invoke average grade down here and I pass in new data, guess what? My grades is going to reference that new data. It's going to be 100, 85, 100. Now, it's okay if you don't like fully understand this, but can I get like a thumb, like I'm starting to understand what parameters and arguments are, like I at least have some idea about what we're talking about? Okay. We're going to keep talking about this and we're going, thanks for all the virtual thumbs for those who have cameras off. That's super helpful and I really appreciate it. I'm going to just erase this stuff. I don't think it's super helpful. There we go. So if you could write one thing down on this one, like if you're a note taker, I would write that parameters are like the placeholder. It's just the label. And arguments are the actual data that's being passed into our function that we can then use and reference by this label. Whoops, by that label. Okay. Let's look at an example. Is anyone like dying to be the next volunteer? Because I'm happy to take volunteers too, or I can just call them people. I really don't mind. But if you're feeling like, feeling like you want to give it a go, I see some smiles. Come on, somebody wants to. 
Sure, I'll give it a go. Yes. Who wait? Who was that? Both AJ and Dewey unmuted. So who no, said it was that? it was Dewey. I, I think it was AJ. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind if you want to uh, go, go ahead, man. <laughs> Now I know that I'll have one of you start and one of you finish. So how about this? AJ, we'll sure. start. And then Dewey's going to finish up on line nine. Okay. Sure. We got right. this. Okay. So let me get my stuff. Now, the only thing, well, we, yeah, I've already talked about that because we still have our call stack. Okay. I think we're good. You want to go through it? Yeah, sure. Or do I just start with line one? And Oh, yeah, you're starting with line one. This is great. Okay. Uh, line one, um, the, func the function average grade. Uh, and my grades is the parameter, which is the placeholder. We're going to call it. Um, we go to line two, which what is... Am I the... gonna, let me ask you this. Am I going to put yep. anything in memory from line one? Hmm? Am I going to put anything in memory from line one? Uh, that's a great question. Do we? No, AJ, you got this. <laughs> um, Is there uh, a label anywhere? Something I, that we might need to reference later. I, I thought that my grades was the reference. It's the placeholder, right? You're right. But remember, what's the function called? Uh, average grade? Yes. So yeah. what's going to go in global memory? Oh, sorry. We're doing that thing. Yeah. Oh, we're oh, doing it sorry. all. Yes. Yes. Average memory will go into global memory. Yes. Okay, average grade is going to go average grade, global memory. Global memory. Yes. And do you remember what we kind of draw as its value when it's a function? Hmm? Huh? Do you remember, like, you know, when we had sum before, we gave yeah, it a that was zero. zero. What is yeah. the value going to be for average grade because it's a function? Um, it's, I think it's whatever we add uh, within the my grades function. It's the, um, not quite. I'm going to give it away. And actually, Sandra got it in the chat. It's called the function definition. So remember, yeah. do you remember this, AJ? Because it's a set of instructions, mm -hmm. you got to draw it like this. It's a function. Its value is a function. Yes. Okay, That's cool. A, yeah. Now, you are right that we have these this parameter called my grades. Now, the cool thing is we don't have to do anything yet because we're not actually using that label yet. Let me ask you one other question. Sure. We've declared this function on line one. Did mm -hmm. we invoke it yet? No. So are we actually going to go into this um, into this function body in line two, or are we going to skip past it? Uh, we're not. We Yes. Yes. We're going to yes. skip past it to line what? A eight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're on line eight. What's going to happen? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um so we are going we are going to run the function correct which is the output which is average grade and the 50 70 50 75 and 100 you're right now let are, me ask you this yes there's this keyword that says const on line eight constant now it's telling us we're declaring a new variable right mm -hmm. what is this variable called <laughs> yeah. Uh, output. Yes. So where are we going to store that? In the uh, local memory, right? Well, good local. question. Look at the call stack. Where, Which execution context are we in right now? Global. Yes. So what memory are we going to use? Global. Yes. So where are we going to put output? Global memory. Hell yeah, we are. Yeah. And, that's what I was thinking. Uh-huh. I know you yeah. were. Yeah. <laughs> and do we have a value yet for output? Do we know what its value is yet? Uh, do you, did you hear me? I said no. You must have broken up a little bit. Let's I was saying no. <laughs> no, you're right. No, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. It's technically called undefined. So we are going to have output and right. it is going to be evaluated undefined because have we run that function yet? No. No. Okay. Now, AJ, hmm. what are the two things that happen when we invoke a function? We have to do two things to kind of set up our area. Well, can I, can, can that now Dewey is really itching to get this going. No, I don't think so. All I think right. he wants you to go through this hard learning. I feel process. like I'm doing, I feel like I get it, but I don't. But I'm That's close. okay. 
Okay. You know what I, can I tell you something, honestly? Yeah. I guarantee you these concepts are going to stick so much better because yeah. you're unsure right now. Sure. So now I'm, I'm thinking, people. yeah, yeah. This just came, this just came to me. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking I want to return address in the uh, stack frame. Oh yeah. We're, yes. We're going to push, push a stack frame to the call stack. Exactly. That's, yep. Okay. That's what, yeah. Uh-huh. Thanks, Sam. Oh, I see. Are we cheating? No. This, you record. said, you specifically said <laughs> that this is a team effort and it's I'm a part true, of the team. True. I'm going to let this slide, AJ. You said Code Smith community. That's and my true. community is helping me out right now. You know what I'm saying? Then I love it. Now, yeah. because we've added this new stack frame to the call stack, we also, mm -hmm. that tells us what, which execution context we're in. We need to uh, open up a new local let yes local execution context oh no that let is a variable you're close so oh. here oh local open up. context yes okay i got it mm -hmm. here we go yeah we're going to open up this local execution context and what is this going to have with it right over here uh the local memory hell yeah okay now a minute I'm going to actually pause you really quick because something new is going to happen that we've never done before. So I wouldn't expect you to know this. So I'm going to like pause your participation just for a second. And then I'm going to have you resume. Okay. Wow. I thought I was doing really well, but okay. Uh, no, you definitely are. You <laughs> no, definitely okay. are. That's Thank why you. I'm not going to set you up for failure by expecting you to know. <laughs> Fair enough. So, now that we have added this new complexity where we have parameters and we have arguments being passed in. One of the first things we have to do with this new local execution context is we have to handle our arguments, okay? What that means is basically pair the parameter label with the actual argument and put it in memory. Because remember how I told you guys is a label for whatever data is actually passed in. So we have to be able to reference that later. So here's what this is gonna look like. Before I even hit line two, I'm going to check my parameter and I see this thing called migrate. That's the label I'm giving it. This is the parameter. And its value is whatever was passed in when we invoked this function. So where did, where did we invoke this function, AJ? What line? Uh, eight. Yes. So can you tell me what the array looks like that we passed in the actual data that is going to be right here? 50, 75, and 100? Hell yes. So I'm going to take this little thing. That is what it looks like when we pair our parameters and our arguments. Mm. Now, when we say my grades, wherever we see my grades in our, oh wait, there we go. In our function, we're referencing that specific array this time around. Next time when Dewey does it, it's going to be referencing a totally different array. Can I get thumbs on this? Because this is like the crux of parameters and arguments that it changes depending on where we invoked it and what context we're in. Okay, cool. AJ, I'm yes. ready for you to hit line two. Great. Uh, so <laughs> right now, um, sum isn't defined, or I'm sorry, sum is defined as zero. And where are uh, we going to store sum? Uh, local memory? Hell yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then we move to line three, where we need to um, define sum again. Yeah. Uh, so sum will equal my grades, and if we're using the uh, arguments, um, my grades would have been 50, as if it's zero, or my grade zero is 50, and then plus my grades one, which is uh, 75, and then my grades two, which is 100. Yes. Okay, then we go to line four. Well, and, and... before we hit line four, mm -hmm. so that equals 225. Sorry, which... yes, that equals 225. And where is that going to go now? Where is that new? Oh, that's we're... the that's the sum now. Yes, because we, just, sum. we reassigned sum on line right. two. So, now... so then we need to cross out, yes, the sum and then okay. redefine it as 225. Awesome, okay. Okay, so now that the sum is 225, um, we are going to define average, which equals sum divided by my grades. Uh, 
that length. Length is the uh, array, the number of numbers, it, which would be three. Um, so it would be sum 225 divided by three. And awesome. Then, Where is this going to go? The 75 was, is uh, average. That is the. In local. And oh, I'm sorry. Yes, in local memory. Awesome. Okay. You're crushing this right now. Uh, right. And so, um, yes, line five uh, returns 75. And then uh, line Where six. Where is, is the... 75 going to be returned to? Huh? Where is that? Where is average or that number, that value 75, where is it going to be returned to? What line of code is it going to kind of go, go back to? Oh, does it go? Oh, shit. I forgot. You're okay. Um, so when we use the return keyword, it's kind of like saying. It's like print, isn't it? In Python? Even, what was that? Is it like print in Python? Um, I or no? Python, so okay. I'm not sure. No, pro that's probably like console. Um, so when we use the return keyword, think to yourself, where did we invoke this function? And that's where the value is going to go. So we invoked it right here, right? Right. We know what this evaluates to. The evaluated result of invoking average grade and passing in this array is 75, okay. which means output is- that's what I thought. Okay. I'm yep. thinking too hard. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Now, we have output there. What are the things, the two things we need to do to kind of clear out our, our area when we're done executing a function? I believe you called it a garbage dump? Yes, we're going to garbage collect. Garbage collect. So we no longer need our local execution context, exactly. Right. And then because we've defined uh, the function within the parentheses, we can just use the um, average grade, the uh, constant average grade as the new, I don't know, what do you call it? The, uh, oh, okay. Are you talking about the function it? definition? Or sure. This is actually going to stay. If we're talking, if you're talking about this, this is going to stay the, the same. Actually, something over here we need to do to finish our cleanup. We're going to pop the stack frame off the. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And pop. now, AJ, you have successfully walked through your first function and you are brand new to JavaScript, right? Easy. No help that at all. That was awesome. Way to go. You've got some like encouragement too that Thanks, guys. was in the chat. Super, thought, so. super simple. Just no, no questions at all. That was awesome. Proud of you. Okay. Now, my friend Dewey, we are JavaScript. JavaScript is done executing line eight. We now yeah, have yes. constant variable output. It's got a value 75 in global memory. We have now hit line nine. Tell me what we're going to do. Okay. So, so am I correct that the, does the global memory stay 75? It is, it is going to say the reason why is because if we were to look like go down as a JavaScript would, this would still be in memory with the function definition. This would still be in memory output of 75. So now we just are putting something new in global memory. What are we going to put in global memory? Okay. Um, looks like what we're declaring a, a new uh, variable called new output. Heck yeah. A uh, const, and um, we're uh, assigning it to to average grade with uh, uh, indexes of 185 and 100. Yep. And let me ask you this: right now in global memory, what is the value of new output going to be? I'm sorry. Say that again. In global memory, what is the value of new output going to be? Do we know what the value is yet? Okay, no, it's going to be undefined. Yep, exactly. In the meantime, what is JavaScript going to do now that we've officially invoked average grade? Okay, so now we're going back up to uh, line two, uh, where we're going to declare a variable called sum. Um, equal well, to zero. Let me ask you this, Dewey. When we invoke a function, two things happen. 
we have to. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. You're, you're good. What do you, what do you remember those two things are? Um, yeah, we need to push, yep. push it to the call stack. Um, yeah, the average grade. Yep. And then our local local memory opens up. Yep, with a local execution context as well. Okay, local execution context. context and in the local memory. Okay. Now, one moment before we get, that was terrible. That's supposed to say average grade. <laughs> I'm going to leave it. That's fine. Now, there was one extra step before we hit line two. Because we are given actual arguments and we have this, parameter as a placeholder, what do we need to do before we hit line two? We have to pair uh, our parameters and. Okay. Um, and arguments. Yeah. So do you do remember you how we're going to do that? So are you referring to what line one function average grade where we insert the argument? Yes. For my grades. Yep. So we have this label, my grades, where's that label? gonna go we have to store uh, it somewhere. okay yeah i'm sorry let's go to local memory yes my grades it's like a label and then what's the actual value going to be yeah it's going to be uh 185 and 100 heck yeah okay so now we're ready for line two hit us with it okay so yeah we're declaring a variable with um sum using let and it's equal to zero, put that in local memory. And then we are redefining sum. Um, we're declaring sum to be equal to my grades index zero plus my grades index one plus my grades index two. Mm -hmm. And what are those corresponding values? Yeah, we have 185, 100. Okay. Awesome job. And so that's going to be 285. And where is that new value going to go? Uh, let's see. That new value is going to um, the local memory. Yes. Okay. Now what? Okay. And then we move down, we're declaring a variable with um, average, called mm -hmm. average using let. And we're taking the sum, uh, which is uh, 285, and we're divided by my grades dot length, which is there's three numbers, so it would be divided by three. Who can do quick math? Put it in the chat for us, will you? Unless you know it. Okay, if I divide by three, yeah. <laughs> Someone get their calculator out for us. Here's my calculator. Nice, AJ, thank you. It's 95, okay? Appreciate the assistance, AJ. Okay, so you have got uh, 95. Uh, and then we're gonna, um, so now we're down to return the average. Awesome. Now, is where is that going to be returned to? Do you remember where okay. we return it? So yeah, we're going back to the the uh, global memory, the new output. Um, we make that ninety five. Now, yeah, it used to be undefined. Now it's ninety five. Perfect. And then, and then there's we're gonna two things we're gonna, we have to do to close down. Yeah, we're gonna pop out the call stack. Heck and yeah! And we're <laughs> you the, clear, clear the garbage in the, yes. the local memory. Amazing. Okay. Way to go, Dewey. Absolutely crushing it. No How do you I'm just, feel about I'm just that? picking back off of AJ. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, when I was listening to your explanation, I couldn't really see a difference. I feel like it was the same way. You know, I didn't have any questions. Do you have any questions? We're like, so I think so. I'm glad I could help. No, it was awesome. You both did great. Hopefully, you learned a little bit along the way as well. So, great. Are there any questions here before we move on to the next one? Really, I'm happy to take questions if anybody does. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing, in fact, can I hit thumbs that we're seeing 
a progression of making these functions better and more reusable and more dynamic, right? If we go back to this first example, example, like this is terrible now. And then this one's really no better. And finally, we're at a place where it's dynamic. We can pass in anything we want. That is the magic of parameters and arguments. We can reuse it. That's awesome. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk very briefly about something called the console. Um, for those of you who are working in CSX or have been using an IDE, um, you are probably familiar with the word console log. It's something that's built into JavaScript. Um, and the reason why we love console logs is because we can't see what's happening with JavaScript under the hood, right? As JavaScript is executing, we don't know what it's doing. We can't see what's happening. But if we explicitly add in what we call console logs like this, then we can get a glimpse at pieces of code. It'll show us what that evaluates to. So this is huge. Um, let's do, oh, actually, I do want to highlight this one point before I move on with this return keyword. The return keyword allows us to take information or data from our function and pass it to the outer context that invoked it. So think back to where I said, where did the function get invoked? That's where the values return to. That was an outer context, right? That was the global execution context. Console logs are different though. They just print something to this thing called the console where we can see outputs. So let's diagram this out. This is gonna be um, a little, quite a bit quicker. The only thing that's different with our kind of area right here is I've added our console over here, okay? We still have everything else. Um, I don't know, some of us newly joined, but does someone wanna, someone who hasn't volunteered wanna do this one? All right, so uh, we're defining the function add func, and we're taking the two parameters num1 and num2. Now, before we do that, we have add func declared and we're, we're storing that label in global memory. What's the value going to be? What's it gonna look like? Um, so as far as the global memory is concerned, it's a uh, function definition. Yes, there we go. So there's its function definition. Now, let me ask you something. Do we care about the parameters or arguments yet? Or do we have to do we have to do anything with those yet? Um, not necessarily as far as JavaScript when it runs through it. So if we're reading it like JavaScript, we can skip right to line five. Exactly. Hit me with line five. So line five is gonna be stored in the global memory as output. And as of right now, it's undefined. Heck yeah. And um, that's invoking the function add func, um, which when we see that, um, the global execution context sees that that is some type of operator and in invoke invocation. So it says, okay, let's start, um, Let's put it on the call stack so that we can go to execute it. I don't know how to quite explain how I understand it, but I just know it. No, you did that really well. Yeah, we have to keep track of the context we're going to be in. So you're right, because we're invoking add func, we're pushing the stack frame to the call stack to help JavaScript uh, keep track of where it is. So way to go with that one. Right, okay. And um once it reads that we're gonna be invoking add func, it's gonna go back to the function itself. Um, and with that, it's gonna create its own um, local execution context and uh, right beside it, its own local memory. There we go. It was like, I can't do this a third time. Okay, so local execution context, local memory. Okay, awesome. And um, it's gonna be taking the two uh, parameters num1 and num2, which are going to be stored in the local memory. I love it. Yeah. And just another just another quick thing, I know this is might be trivial to most, but one thing I had a hard time understanding is that the parameters can be named anything. You can name it chicken, potatoes, fries, beans, you can name it whatever you'd like. I, I always was curious, like, where are they getting these num1 or num2? I always thought it was like something yeah. that's like, like built into JavaScript. 
No, a hundred percent. And on that same note, I'm glad you said that when you, or like, if you're the one declaring the function, you decide what you want to refer to it as later. So within this add fug function, I want to reference it as num one and num two, because I'm expecting a number and another number, right? So yes, you, you just want to name it something that makes sense semantically. So thanks for that, Elijah. Now, um, Elijah, enlighten me. How do I know which one of these is going to be num one and which one's going to be num two? Can you explain how we're going to figure that out? Right. So JavaScript naturally takes in the parameters as it was given through the arguments. So if you were to change it to 7550, mm -hmm. essentially with this function, it's not, it doesn't, won't matter too much because 75 plus 50 is the same as 50 plus 75. But if it were for some, with something with a different operator, like a division sign, for example, it would be very crucial that the, the numbers that you're putting in order are in order because mm -hmm. uh, the function add func will do as so as the numbers were provided with the arguments. So num1 is going to be whatever is assigned through the argument as the first number. Exactly. So it's simply a matter of order. Because num1 is the first argument or parameter, 50 is going to be uh, basically assigned to num1. So they're just corresponding to the order. Simple as that. So num1 is going to be 50 and num2 is 75. Okay, continue on. Oops, continue on now to line two for me. All right, so we're still inside the local. Um, we're still inside the call stack. So um, we still need to execute that. So we're still within the local execution context. Um, so console.log is going to be when we're going to be first using the, um, I don't know if it's a property or whatever, but we're going to be storing um, that into the le local execution context at first until we start to get, gather the values of um, num1 and num2 so that we can return because console.log will, um, it's essentially its own function because it will return whatever's put into the parameters or the arguments of that um, console.log. So. Okay, so I'm going to pause really quick to explain one thing that we don't know about console log yet. So this is a little bit, um, a little bit more in depth, and I'm not going to say much about it. But console log is part of JavaScript, but it behaves a little bit differently than some other functions. Console log is a function, but it's a special kind, and because of it, we actually are going to push a stack frame to the call stack. It's just going to be a console log one, console.log, whatever we're console logging. Now, we're not creating our own local execution context. This is simply something it needs to go do before it returns back to this execution context. But let me ask you this. When we console log num1 and num2, what is num1 evaluated to? Um, well, assuming that it's been through line five already, 50. Uh, well, we did hit line five already. So 50. Yes. So num one is 50. And then what's line two or num two? 75. Awesome. So if we were to console log 50 plus 75 over here, what would be in the console? What would show up? Uh, 225 or 125. Yep. You got it. So over here, 125 would appear in the console. And then because that console log is done, this would be popped off the call stack. Okay. And we're done executing our function, right? There's no other line of code, right, Elijah? All right. So what would we do with our local execution context? And what would we do with our stack, uh, call stack? Um, well, it would be popped off the call stack and it would be garbage collected. Um, exactly. So let me do context. that. And then you're going to keep going. Now, something next happens. We're still, we're in the global execution context. But JavaScript is like, ah, I got to do this. I got a console log output. So remember, I know this is small and it's not super important, but important enough that I'm going to say we would push a stack frame to the call stack for console log. And let me ask you this, Elijah, what yeah. would appear in the console now? We console log output. Um, it would show 50, 75, and then 125. Well, let's see, if we're thinking like JavaScript, JavaScript would say, okay, output, let me go look in memory and see if I know something right here. 
what is the value of output? Um, 125. Is it? Oh, or well, it's still undefined. It is. I'm going to tell you what would happen. In the console, we would get undefined because the current value of output is undefined. Now, if anyone is like, what the hell? We just figured out it was 125. We added num1 and num2, but did we ever use the return keyword? We never used the return keyword. Therefore, we never returned a value out of that execution context. All we did was show in the console what our two numbers were added together. We never said, take that value and bring it back here. We never returned it here. So this remains undefined. This is one of the reasons explicitly using the return keyword is really important. We don't always have to do it, but usually you want to use the return keyword to properly exit out of the function and make sure that you're getting a value out of that function when you need it. Okay. So this was kind of a trick one because it's going to be undefined. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Cool. Okay, Elijah, awesome job. And the last thing that would happen is this would be popped off. And there it is. Okay, any questions here? Okay, we only have one more uh, example to get to. It's gonna be about objects. Well, two quick demos, but one more thing. Oh yeah, Crystal, I'll come back over here. Sorry, it took me a second. And oh, you're good. The computer. Um, out of curiosity, what I know, because I'm a little bit into the CSX work logs, yeah. what would happen if there was multiple nested functions, but only one return value? Would it go all the way out to the external memory or would it stay in local since if there's more than one? It depends. So it depends on where you're returning it to. And it it would I would have to look at a code example to to give you an answer because it's really dependent on the function. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have to say it depends. Okay. Sorry. I know you probably wanted a more concrete answer, but no, that's all good. I was just curious. It was like a, for sure, for sure, like only leaving the one nest at a time or if it depended on what the actual return to yeah. was. Okay. It all I yeah. Thank yeah. You. I like where you're thinking though. Awesome. Okay. So this is the last thing. So we talked about functions, right? Now we're going to talk about objects. And this is going to be relatively a quick part, but it's a really fun part. I really like this area. So you can think of objects and arrays as being very, very similar, but there are definitely core differences. They are both data types that store information inside of them. With arrays, I'm going to get my marker out again. With arrays, we use square brackets. We saw that in the other examples. Okay. With objects, we use these curly brackets or curly braces. Okay. The other big, big, big difference between objects and arrays is that in arrays, we usually just have like values on their own like this. You can have nested ones, but we're not going to go there. But with objects, it looks a little different. In objects, we have what we call key value pairs, okay? I'm actually gonna write that because it's nice to know. Key value pairs. Another little side note, when you hear the word key, oh, that's hard to see on there. Key is the same as a property. So if I say the property name or I say the key name, I'm talking about the same thing. They're synonymous, okay? Just so you know, because I might use them both. I, I say them both. Okay, so objects have these key value pairs. Here's how I like to think about key value pairs. It's kind of like a variable, right? You have a label and then you have a value. So here my label is name and the value is will. I have the label company and the value code smith. Something cool about objects, and you, if you attend the variable workshop, you will learn more about this. Um, objects can store, same with arrays, all different kinds of data types as values. So you can see here, 
this is a string stored as a value. This is a number stored as a value. Here's Boolean stored as a value. Here's an array stored as a value. You can even have an object as a value. So you can have nested objects, okay? One other thing to know before we get into this demo is every single key in all objects are strings under the hood. Does everybody know what a string is? If you don't, it's just a type of very uh, a type of data that we use. Okay. So, even though these don't have the little quotation marks, those are all string uh, strings under the hood. All right. Let's look at a little quick demo. Here I have this um, object called person. I'm declaring an object. The label is person and its value is an object, right? And it has all these different key value pairs. We're going to use global memory. We're not, there's not going to be an execution context for this. Okay. We're not going to talk about the call stack because we're not talking about functions anymore. We're talking about objects. So here I have in global memory this object because that would be stored in global memory. There are different ways to access information in objects. We can use something called dot notation. We can use something called bracket notation. They're a little bit different. They can do a little bit of different things, but essentially for purposes of intro course, they're the same. And I'm going to show you how we can access values from our object using bracket or dot notation. Okay. Um, so let's look at a little example here. If we look at line nine, we have person dot name. And we're going to, let me move this because I'm going to pretend we're console logging a lot of these. Okay. If we were to try and console log person dot name, and we're thinking like JavaScript, I'm going to tell you what JavaScript would do. The first thing JavaScript would do is going to look on the left of the dot, and it's going to say, do I have anything in memory called person? And Anna, do we have something in memory called person? Uh, yeah, the constant variable person. Yes. So now, and you'll stick with me if you don't mind, now JavaScript is going to look on the right of the dot. And it sees this val it sees this thing name. It's going to look in that person object and see if there's a key called name. Do you see anything called name? Uh, yes, Will. Okay. What is the value of that key? Uh, Will? Exactly. So if we were to console log person.name, what value would we get? Will. Exactly. Okay. So Kind of as simple as that for dot notation. You look at on the left in memory, see if it's there. If it is, stick with it. And then look at the right, see what's there and try and find that key in that object. So let's look at another one. And um, Anna, you want to stick with me for a little bit? Sure. Cool. Okay. Also, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now... Anna, let's look at this one. This one is going to be bracket notation. So it's going to look a little bit different, but it's going to be the same thing. JavaScript is going to look at the left of the opening bracket. Does it see something called person in memory? Uh, yes. Yep, we still got it. So then it's going to look on the right of that opening bracket. Do we see a key or a property called fave num? Yes, 17. Perfect. So what would be put in the console? What would be basically printed to the console? Uh, 17. Absolutely. Okay. This probably feels very simple, very easy. Let's look at a little bit harder one now. And I'll stick with you. So I'm actually going to start. Let's do this. I'm going to cover one of this up, one of these up. Don't look here yet. Okay. Let's, uh, can you tell me what JavaScript would do if we tried to console log person.fave snacks? Like how would JavaScript think? It would look uh, towards the, to the left of the period to person. Yep. Um, and then look for the value favorite snacks 
and then it would log the array? Absolutely. So this is what it would look like. Now, let me ask you this. Oops, I copied the wrong one. Copy, paste image, perfect. Okay, so it would log this. Now, let me ask you this. What if I wanted you to console log person dot fave snacks at the zero index? What would it console then? Um, it would again uh, go uh, look to the left, um, identify a person, uh, look for the value of favorite snacks, but this time to the zero index, which would be twin snakes. Absolutely, it would be the string twin snakes. Awesome, thank you, Anna. I appreciate it. Okay. Before we move on to, I think, our final example, are there questions here? Okay, here we go. Now, the last piece of this is kind of bringing it all together, all right? We're going to bring together this idea of consoles. We're going to bring together, oh, Sam, yes. So Sam says, um, is this object the same as class objects or are they different from class objects? Great question, Sam. That is different. So these are just your standard object. We're not talking about like object-oriented programming, like class constructors or anything like that. So if anyone else just heard me and was so confused, don't even worry. It's more advanced. And that's not what this is. But great question, Sam. And the second one. Is the object mentioned in slide 24 addressed as data objects? The data? Oh, right. I think I just answered that. So those are different things. Cool. Oh, thanks, Sam. Okay, awesome. Let's do this. So we're bringing it all together. This is going to have an object as our example. But in this object, there's a function. And in that function, there's a console. Law, okay, this is the culmination of it all. A little side note, a thing for you to know. So when we have a function that lives in an object, it has a special name. It's called a method. So if someone says like the method, they're talking about a function in an object. You can still call it a function too, but a more technical, uh, technically accurate way of referencing it would be a method. So like here on this right here, this is a method. Now, the other thing I said at the very, very beginning of this lecture or workshop, I said that the reason objects are so great is because you can have data and functionality. Right here, this is data. We've got all this random data in this object, but now we also have functionality. We can do stuff dynamically also. It all lives in this one object. It's all encapsulated. This is the beauty of objects, okay? We're gonna walk through this one example um, right here. I've already got some of it set up. We're still gonna have global memory and we're still gonna pretend that we're consoling things. I don't formally have a console, but you can pretend. So let's look at this. We still have this uh, person object in memory. It has all those same key value pairs, but now we have a method. We have this function, it's called greeting. Greeting is the name of the function. And in memory, rather than having that whole function body, it's still just the function definition that's stored, okay? Let's see, um, Sandra, do you want to work with me on this one? It's okay if you don't want to. I wouldn't force you. Um, I, I just don't know. I mean, it's a little different, the setup. But um, yeah. if you can just, I guess, pull it out for me, maybe I'll be able to. I can totally help you out with this one, I promise, okay? I won't leave you hanging. Okay, so let's start here. Let me um, ask you a question really quick. If I were to console log person dot name, 
can you tell me kind of what JavaScript would do and what we would see in the console? Well, what we would see in the console would be will. Yep. Exactly. And the reason is with documentation, you look on the left, JavaScript would. It would go look in memory to see if there's something called person, and there is. And then it's going to look on the right, and it sees name, this labeled name. It looks for that key or property in the object, and it finds it right here. And so then it gives us the value associated with it. Okay, awesome. Now, this one's going to be a little bit different, but I promise it's not too bad. Um, this time, let's do this. Let's pretend we were going to console log person.greeting. Let's go through like JavaScript step by step. It's going to check the left of the dot and what's it going to find in local memory? It's uh, going to find the object in global memory. For yep. Person. person. Okay. And so now it's going to check the right side and it find is it going to find something called greeting? It's going to find a uh, method for greeting. Awesome. Now, let me ask you this. Do you remember what happens when we have a function name like greeting and then we use parentheses right after? What is that telling JavaScript to do? Uh, asking JavaScript to it's invoking the greeting function. Exactly. So what would happen under the hood is we would open up our local execution context with our local memory. We'd have our, our stack frame on the call stack. We don't even have to worry about that. Let's pretend all that's taken care of. We're in the function. What's going to happen right here on line eight? Console.log would be put on the stack. Yeah, you remember that part. Yeah, I wasn't even talking about that, but you're right. We would have that console on the stack frame. And what would show up in our console? Um, the string, hello, comma, everybody. You did it. That's it. I knew awesome. you could do it, Sandra. I knew you could do it. <laughs> awesome, awesome job. Okay, so that's a little bit about how we could, for instance, invoke a function on an object. You guys, I forgot something really important in the last slide. So I have to go back because this is super, super important. And I think you won't mind. So let me move this. Um, okay. I showed you over here, so we're backtracking now. I showed you how to access values in an object, but I wanted to show you two other things. I wanted to show you how to add a key value pair to an object, and I also wanted to show you how to reassign a value. This will be quick, and I'll do it really quick with you. So let's see. Um, let me delete all of this. So let's say I wanted to add a new key value pair to my person object. It's actually going to be very, very, very similar. You ready for this? I'm just going to show you all. I would do something like person. Let me actually expand this really quick. Oh, I'm going to just raise that. Okay. Oh, I, I don't want to console log it. Sorry. Person dot, let's say, let's say we want to add a fave city. And then I could give it a value. So here's what's happening with JavaScript. If JavaScript were to encounter this line, it's still going to look on the left of that dot, right? It finds person. Then it's going to look on the right of that dot. It's going to say, okay, go look in that person object. Is there something, is there a key called fave city? And Dewey, does it find fave city in our person object? No. So here's what it's going to do. It's going to say, oh, they must want to add this key value bear because I see a value. So over here, we would get this new key. And it would be assigned a, this string Salt Lake City. That's it. We just added a key value pair. 
The process is the same. That dot is the same. I could have done it with brackets also, by the way. I chose to do it with a dot, but I could do it with those brackets. Now, let's say I wanted to change or reassign a value. It's going to be exactly the same thing. So let's see. AJ said he lived in or he's in LA, right? So let's pretend that AJ is like, no, 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 no. The Fave City is not Salt Lake City. The Fave City is LA. Here's what we would do. The exact same thing. Now, when JavaScript goes in this time, here's what it's going to be thinking. It's going to look on the left. It finds person, that person object in memory. It's going to look to the right and it's going to say, is there a key called Fave City? And there is. But then JavaScript is going to say, wait a minute, they're reassigning this value. Whatever it was before, scratch that, replace it with this new value. So JavaScript would go in, it would say, no, 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 it's not Salt Lake City. It's Los Angeles. And just like that, it's updated. One way I like to think of key, the values in objects is it's kind of like these are all declared with that let keyword. JavaScript is going to let us change any of the values that we want. I could change any of these values, okay? That's why we are allowed to do that. Are there any questions about that? All right, y'all are doing awesome. I know it's late, you're doing great. Okay, we talked about that. Phew. So we talked about functions. It prevents duplication, prevents us from repeating ourselves. We can basically bundle instructions and reuse it as many times as we want. We talked about execution context. We always start in global, and then as we invoke functions, we create these new local execution contexts with their own local memory. And to keep track of that, JavaScript uses the, stack, the call stack to figure out where it's uh, currently functioning. We talked about objects, data, functionality, encapsulated in one area. And we did not talk about object looping. This was not actually a part of this one. So you'll have to attend a different workshop to get that one. Okay. Well, I really appreciate um, everyone's time and engagement. That was awesome. Um, if you are in the CSX Slack channel and you ever have questions about CodeSmith or the prep programs or anything like that, Feel free to uh, find me and message me. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and if no one else has any questions, then you are all good to go. And I hope you all have a great night. <laughs>